Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about a new book called How America Works and Why It Doesn't, a brief guide to the U.S. political system by our guest, William Cooper, who is an attorney, national columnist, award-winning author. His commentary has appeared in hundreds of publications around the world, including the New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, San Francisco Chronicle, Chicago Sun-Times, Dallas Morning News, Huffington Post, Toronto Star, and Jerusalem Post. Publishers Weekly calls his writing about American politics a compelling rallying cry for democratic institutions under threat in America. Uh, William Cooper, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thanks, David. Great to be here. Thanks for coming on. Um, I think I'm most interested in the and why it doesn't part uh, of the book, but uh, give us any sort of background you like. I, uh, why doesn't the U.S. government work? Well, I think the the boilerplate sort of headline answer is that far too few Americans either understand or care how it is supposed to work. And as a result, there's this race to the bottom in the political system where every both sides are trying to achieve short-term victories instead of taking the longer view. And the longer view is rooted in the basic principles of how the system works, the, the underpinnings um, of our constitutional system. And I think we're getting so far away from that for a variety of reasons um, that the country in a lot of ways has stopped working the way it's supposed to. I, I, I'm very much inclined to agree with your thesis and with much of the book, but let me play devil's advocate a little bit. I mean, you're, 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 you're asking people to buy a book blaming the people. And when I look at polls, I would take uh, people's opinions on polls, even polling that I consider highly misleading in the questioning over the actual governance of the US government any day. And there have been studies of the US government that find that its decisions almost always line up with the opinions of the very wealthy and rarely if ever are impacted by the views of the public where they disagree with the views of the very wealthy. Um, why, why, why blame the people? Well, I don't blame the people versus the government. My view is that the people and the government are essentially one and the same. And so I think the population itself, which feeds the government, right? Marjorie Taylor Greene was a citizen in Georgia a few years ago, and now she's an influential congressperson. I mean, they're, it's all coming from the same place. And to me, whether you're wealthy or not wealthy, there's a tendency, a strong tendency to disregard longer term, more rational thinking in favor of the short term views I talked about. Now, it, in terms of public opinion polls, we are a republic. Uh, we're not, we don't operate as a direct democracy where people's individual opinions are, you know, the basis of governmental decision making. And I, I think that's a good thing. I think the alternative of just flipping and flopping in every direction uh, uh, of government with the with the winds of public opinion wouldn't be a good approach. I'm not suggesting that you said that was the right approach, but but I do think having that division between the people in government with the republic and a layer in between is actually a good thing if the system as a whole is administered the right way. Well, I did say I would prefer that. I mean, I look at the polls. We <laughs> could end the war in Palestine. We could end the war in Ukraine. We could move money from weapons to schools and the environment. Uh, we could do all kinds of things. Some I would disagree with, but on the whole, I would agree more with what a democracy would do than with what this uh, republic that we both agree is a highly <laughs> broken republic is doing. I mean, doesn't it's not even close. I think I think that's fair in a way. Um, you also the our system is intended to have checks and balances where um, you know somebody might say, "Oh, would you would you like to have this or like to have that?" And it's not something that would 
would you know be constitutionally valid or something there might not be funding for that particular policy um so i i definitely agree that if you were to take public opinion polls you would find a lot i don't know what the preponderance would be but you would find lots of cases where yes the people the you know the current majority of public opinion is better than the current policy i think gun guns are a great example there's a really strong view among the people that i share that we need radical change with our approach to guns yeah. uh, and yet we've got the second amendment we've got bicameral legislature president all these things that are preventing that and i'd, I'd much rather have the public opinion um, so there's merit to what you said i don't know whether i would line it up you know more or less with what the government's doing though well, let's let's look at the Republic and what's wrong with it, because this is a big focus of the book where you look at at tribalism and at social media and at the two party system. And by tribalism, you don't mean devaluing 96 percent of humanity and Joe Biden running the world, whereas only 4% of the world has anything to do with putting him in office. Uh, and, you know, of course, Trump's view of destroy Gaza faster, you know, but tribalism, meaning political partisanship, meaning the Democratic tribe and the Republican tribe, right? Yes, that's exactly right. What's yeah, wrong I think, with that? So I think, I think there's very widespread irrationality in the population views about politics. I think if you look at the opinions of many, many people, it's unmoored from the facts and unmoored from the data. And what drives that very often is tribalism in, in the sense of antipathy for the other side. If the other side is doing something, it's automatically bad, it's automatically evil, it's automatically a mistake. And then if your side is doing it, um, there's this forgiveness and a, a willingness to embrace it because it's your it's your tribe. And the, the quintessential two examples of this are the presidential candidates. I don't think it's rational for the Republicans to have as their champion someone who tried to overthrow the last election and who you know, fundamentally at odds with some of the most basic principles of our system in Donald Trump. And if, if there were more rational people in the Republican Party, they never would have jumped on that train to begin with. At the same time, I think it's very irrational for the Democrats to be supporting Joe Biden, who clearly, and this has been true for a long time, is well past his prime and not in a, you know, the peak of his intellectual powers the way you know, presidential candidates should. And if you didn't have tribalism driving what people think, you wouldn't see things like that. And yet, in all the polls, the majority of the Democrats for years have said they'd rather Joe Biden take a hike and have somebody else, but they don't have the ability to make that happen. They weren't permitted any serious primaries. Uh, they have no access to put anyone on the ballot. They have no control over what happens at the convention or if there's even a serious convention at all, or it's all a virtual staged event uh you know if it were up to the 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 majority decision of the people who identify as democrats uh they'd agree with you and me and joe biden would be you know 24 7 rehoboth beach ice cream every day one of the th so my my thesis is there's three elements that all work together that are underlying why america isn't working one of them's tribalism the other one is the internet and social media. And then the third category is what you're touching on, which is a broken political system. And you gave some really good examples for how the will of the people doesn't often come through in the political system. I think what you said is true. I think a year ago, it was much less true that people wanted Biden out, although I think they should have thought that a year ago. And I also think even now, there's a significant number of people still supporting Biden in a way that 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 I consider to be quite irrational. Yeah, well, there were at least some polls even two years ago, a majority of Democrats wanted him out. Um, well, well, let's talk about those other two topics, social media and the two-party system. Uh, 
what's wrong with those wonderful inventions, new and old? <laughs> yeah. So social media, and uh, that's the most important part, but it's really evolution of the internet, which is this, this brand new communication system, right? So human beings have been around for a very long time. Our brains were, came up for thousands and thousands and thousands of years where we, you're, you're communicating with people close to you, right? You're telling stories at the fire, you're drawing, you know, cave paintings, you're, you're, you're communicating locally. That's how our brains were evolved to think and to function. And then, you know, last century, we get the radio, we get a television, and then we have this huge explosion uh, about 25 years ago on the internet. And all of a sudden, um, you can press a few buttons and just join a tribe online and have this eco chamber of information coming your way um, where it really narrows your worldview and it really turbocharges you know the tribalism that that i mentioned before so the, it's a these three elements are a flywheel that all kind of make each other worse and i think with social media it can be oversimplified for sure it's not like this for everybody but the tendency for people to join groups online to really celebrate the information they like and deflect or ignore the information they don't, that causes the two political tribes to grow further and further apart. So that's the social media side of it. And then on the governmental uh, structure side of it, what you would want, since human beings you know, have age old cognitive biases, right? We all do, we always have confirmation bias and things of that nature. And we've got social media exacerbating that, as I just outlined. What you would want in a political system is something that tames those passions. You'd want something that puts a check on this, you know, flywheel that's happening where people are getting more and more irrational. But what we have is the exact opposite. We have a system that turbocharges these passions. We've got two juggernaut parties, Democrats and Republicans. We don't have room for any additional serious players. We've got closed primaries. We've got all sorts of scenarios with the way we govern that you mentioned, David, that I thought was a great point where the will of the people is stymied. And when you take it all together, uh, these three elements have led to the irrationality I, I mentioned at the outset. We're speaking with William Cooper and the book again is called How America Works and Why It Doesn't. Um, I. I, of course, have uh, nothing but disgust for the the irrationality of the partisanship of the two party system. Uh, but this is one of the few, if not the only book about this rotten system I've read in many years that doesn't even mention money. Uh, you know, ha have you noticed <laughs> that these candidates are bought and paid for, that the Republicans just are buying Democratic primary elections doesn't matter if they're open or closed they're being purchased uh by in in large measure uh, a lobby group for a foreign government in in apac uh is is there not a problem with the lack of not just access to ballots but access to media coverage access to debates access to participation in the whole system and the bar being set by money. Uh, there, there's no public financing. It's, there's <laughs> financing by those who have the money. It, it's a great point, David. And I think you're right. Um, and and it's a relatively short book. It's 200 something pages. I had to pick and choose a little bit, but I think you make a really good point. And it, I could easily have included a more emphatic focus on that. I talked about power and influence a little bit. For example, I talked about the NRA and how influential they are. And certainly money is behind that in a, in a significant way. Uh, but you make you make a good point. I think if I if I do a second edition, I could add some uh, some on the money because you're, you're right. It's a it's a big problem. It's complicated, uh, but it's certainly a big driver and a more ideal system would have a very different approach to money and politics. 
the book, I should say, does take up the topic of wealth inequality. Um, and presumably, you think we should do something in the way of progressive taxation to not have such extreme wealth inequality. If everybody had the same amount of money, then, or somewhere reasonably in the general ballpark of the same amount of money, then money running the system wouldn't be quite as big a deal, perhaps. Yeah, I think the inequality is a huge problem. To me, it, the 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 real problem is just the excessive inequality. You've got individuals worth hundreds of billions of dollars. Their their wealth fluctuates in the billions on a daily basis. And and then millions of people struggling to get by with food and shelter. And how how those two things can coexist to me is is a real a really stunning tragedy. Uh, to me, the solution is very significant redistribution of the upper echelon of wealth, taking that you know extraordinary uh, inequality and and trying to uh, redeploy and reallocate those resources. I do think, however, that an ideal system does have some amount of inequality. I don't mind. You know, one individual who works really, really hard, is very creative, very innovative, does a lot of things to help society, getting rewarded for that, whereas another individual who chooses not to work hard, not to contribute, not to be innovative, you know, not have the same net worth. I just think it's the extremes that are, you know, really appalling. And frankly, you know, cast a, a cloud over the whole country in a lot of ways. I mean, it's a very widespread problem to have such excessive inequality. And again, of course, you have one of the two parties not wanting to fix that at all, and the other promising to fix it and then doing nothing to fix it. <laughs> so these yeah. are your, the choices you're given. Uh, Agreed. Um, and in recent years, you it actually is interesting how you're seeing a lot of big money shifting from Republicans to, to Democrats. A lot of the corporate support and things of that nature is now much more Democratic compared to Republican than it used to be. But you're right. The incumbents do not want to limit themselves. Uh, you, uh, that's exactly right. One of the, there are a lot of interesting topics in this book. Uh, one of the problems you cite is the criminalization of politics uh, by prosecutors. Um, but of course, the, the other side would be, shouldn't elected officials be held accountable and not be given immunity uh, for criminal offenses as the Supreme Court would have it and Richard Nixon would have it. Well, I, I, as I outlined in the book, I agree that you need to look at both sides of the equation. It's very damaging to criminalize politics and to have prosecutors going after presidents and other politicians in a way that's unfair. At the same time, certainly running for office is not a license to commit crimes and, and a grant of immunity. Um, and, and so what we need to do is be very, very thoughtful and understand how important these decisions are. Uh, it is very damaging to a country to have its leaders just constantly under attack. And if we go that route, if Joe Biden starts getting prosecuted by Republicans when he leaves office and then the next person gets prosecuted by Democrats when they leave. Off. If that hap if that happens and we have that race to the bottom, I think I think it would be very very damaging. On the Supreme Court case, um, the um, the court rejected Trump's argument for uh, immunity for personal acts. I thought that was very much the right decision and shouldn't shouldn't be left out of the equation. Donald Trump wanted full immunity for all of his activities. So I, I don't think his conviction in New York is under any jeopardy because of the New York, uh, the, the recent court decision. What they did say is official acts are immune. And that's a very broad ruling. I think, I think reasonable minds can differ about that particular ruling. Uh, but certainly I don't, I don't think either extreme, letting politicians completely off the hook or going after them in an unfair way uh, is the right approach. It seems that built into the system, there was supposed to be a tool for the legislative branch called impeachment uh, that is currently used 
only when a president uh, may or may not have committed some uh, outrageous abuse of power of a type that the other party doesn't typically engage in. Uh, and so it's a really selective <laughs> list that you can- Good way to put it, I, li I like that. <laughs> or uh, in the book, you note that many were upset by George W. Bush's abuse of war powers and then not upset by President Obama's similar abuse of war powers. But they were still abuses, even if there are hypocrites at large in society, they were still abuses that will not be impeached by any Congress because it's a sort of abuse that's bipartisan, right? It's so, um, it, I think that's a great framework for thinking about it. I will, I will, that you have added uh, in a, a nice way to my perspective because I hadn't thought about it in those terms, but I think that's right. Um, I think personally, I think it's important that in national security realm, uh, there's, you know, two choices in terms of how you think about this. One is to is to give presidents broad leeway to make decisions, uh, you know, duly elected presidents that are commander in chief, give them leeway to make decisions I, uh, in broadly way, even if it upsets a lot of people. I think that's the right approach. I think overusing impeachment or prosecutorial powers in the realm of national security is very dangerous. I want presidents making their decisions um, based on their best assessment of what, what needs to happen, uh, as opposed to worrying and looking over their shoulder that some local prosecutor in their, in their neighborhood is gonna come, you know, throw them in jail when they're, when they're done with their presidency. I don't like either one. There's, there's concerns, problems, insecurities in either direction. Uh, I just I just think the world's too dangerous to have, uh, you know, some North Dakota prosecutor throwing the president of the United States in jail right after he leaves because he disagreed with some drone strike. Typically, he or she cannot because of the argument that Congress let it happen and therefore Congress approved it and therefore it's not in the realm of local prosecutions. Um, if you I've never heard that before. Oh, well, you've never tried to put war criminal presidents in prison before. Um, it, it, this is, I mean, the typical defense. I, I don't, uh, I'm not aware of any, anything. If the Supreme Court had, had ruled in a different way and said, yeah, there's, you know, limited immunity for official acts. I'm not aware of any law that would prevent some local prosecutor in some town that the president has a vacation home in or something throwing them in jail if they get a conviction from a local jury the second they leave off i i'm not aware of any federal or any other law that would prevent that it would be a real problem in my opinion well the typical argument that the judge or the jury uh is going to be looking at is that uh this was an authorized war because congress didn't lift a finger to stop it um and if you look at the weapons shipments to israel that pretty clearly currently violate seven or eight u.s laws uh you know are those laws or are those not laws are they not laws if the president does it as richard nixon would have it uh i i don't yeah. I don't think the problem is that local prosecutors are going to take them up years from now. I think the problem is that Congress is ignoring them as we speak. It, it's a good point and a good issue in the world. You know, the Constitution says the war power is vested in Congress, not the president. So and there's a War Powers Act trying to get that back. So our, one of the largest disconnects with how we function as a country compared to what the Constitution says explicitly is in this is very context so not only are there laws that, that you mentioned the constitution itself says that quote unquote congress shall have the power to declare war we've just completely cast that aside as a country yes indeed um i i want to ask you uh william cooper about Donald Trump uh, before we run out of time, because now he's he's faced an assassination attempt uh, and uh, is proclaiming himself, uh, you know, the opponent of violence in politics. And you point out, I think correctly in the book, that his statements on January 6th were not inciting violence. But I wanted him prosecuted for inciting violence when he was campaigning for president the first time when he said things like, quote, 
if you see somebody getting ready to throw a tomato, knock the crap out of them. I promise you, I will pay the legal fees. You know what I hate? There's a guy totally disruptive throwing punches. We're not allowed to punch back anymore. I love the old days, et cetera, et cetera. I can give you six or eight statements of explicit advocacy for punching, kicking, and hauling people out and beating the crap out of them at Trump rallies the first time he ran for president. Wouldn't it be better to prosecute these people when they first commit crimes and not yeah. and not years later when it's a bigger incident, but the evidence is less clear? I think if, if that the um, if a clear crime is committed, uh, it meets each element of an offense, uh, there should be a prosecution um, and the and the sentence and punishment the prosecutor seeks should be proportionate to to the action and i think inciting violence uh is certainly a category that that could be could be there um you know it's uh it's a hard question i mean if you've got the candidate for president of one political party uh if you're going to throw them in jail and and potentially impact the outcome of a presidential election, there better be pretty strong, pretty strong basis and pretty clear crime. Uh, but I do, you know, in the general context of criminal liability, when it's not a president sitting in the Oval Office making a decision that's central to the national security of the country, but they're acting as a citizen and breaking the law, I think it's certainly appropriate to pursue charges. Well, I think it would have been, uh, what, eight years ago, seven years ago. Donald would have Trump. saved us a lot of uh, a lot of consternation if he was sitting in a, a local jail cell all this time instead of uh, 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 being president and, and running again. I, I'm inclined to agree. Uh, we're speaking with William Cooper. The book is How America Works and Why It Doesn't. We have about two minutes uh what do people need to know? Uh, what should they do? How can they follow up with your work? Well, thank you, David. I really, I really appreciate your time and just your questions have been great. And I, I really appreciate your perspective and, and your show. Um, if there's anything I can get from the book, it's just having people think about these issues. You know, I, I know that I'm not going to be changing hearts and minds on any grand scale uh, with my, with my writing, but if I can get people to think th these issues through, have you know, respectful, intelligent conversations like you and I have had today, yeah, that would be a huge win. Um, and as far as, uh, you know, getting a hold of me and connecting with me, my website is will-cooper.com. I've experienced a little bit of uh, cybersecurity challenges lately, where, uh, but I'm going to try to get those remedied and get the website back up and running. Uh, but I'm always happy to engage with, with readers. I love talking about these issues. It's tons of fun and, and really important. I think it, you know, more people focusing on the things that matter and, and, and less on sort of the hysterics and gossip of politics, the better. And you know, your show is a great example of that. Very well said. William Cooper, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. Really appreciate you having me. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.